Well, good evening, and welcome to Question Lab. This is your host, Jeff Downing, and I am here uh, to welcome you to another session where we slice and dice board style questions in order to help you prepare for exams in the boards. Uh, tonight, we are going to be tackling respiratory pathology, respiratory pathology. So that is uh, all of the questions that we're going to be uh, we're going to be tackling are going to be within that category. So we uh, uh, first off just want to welcome any of you new folks out there. Uh, if you are uh, new to Question Lab, let us know down in the question box. I want to start off uh, by introducing you to the folks that are going to be helping tonight, uh, including my co-host tonight, Dr. Paris Vicaria. Paris, would you mind introducing yourself? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Jeff. Hey, guys, my name is Paris. I'm a uh, current dermatology resident at uh, UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. Um, I originally graduated from pharmacy school and then went on further to do medical school. Um, I also work as an RX coach uh, for USMLE RX. So what that means is, you know, I work one on one with students such as yourself to help prepare you guys for the USMLE Step 1 and Step 2 CK as well. And I'm happy to help lead tonight's session. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about RX Coach later on this evening, but uh, really want you to know that that uh, the the way that we approach questions and the way that we handle them here in Question Lab very similar uh, to the way that our RX coaches do it within their tutoring sessions. So you're gonna uh, you're you know get to hear uh, and see a little bit of uh, our methodology, but that is key. We really feel like uh, for you know, uh, students to uh, to advance and to, to to get to the level where they need to be in order to do well on uh, their board exams. You do need to have a method, and you need to need to have a a uniform approach. So uh, hopefully, you're going to be able to uh, 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 walk away tonight with some uh, some more tips and some knowledge. Or a vignette. They're asking us, they're telling us that she's forcibly exhaling and she's using certain muscles to expel the air as quickly as she can. So that's important. It's forcibly exhaled very quickly. Okay. They're then asking us in the lead in about the physiologic event most likely occurring during this forced expiration. So, how many steps is this question? Well, um, I think you could argue that this is maybe a one-step question. I think we know that this pa patient is forcibly expiring. So what is occurring physiologically during forced expiration? Let's go ahead, let's take a look at those answer choices. And once again, we're gonna start at the bottom and we're gonna work our way up to the top. Answer choice E, transmural pressure of zero. D, negative pleural pressure. C negative alveolar pressure, B, intraalveolar pressure equal to atmospheric pressure, and A, airway compression that limits flow. Let me go ahead and we're gonna take a, make sure you take a good look at those answer choices. Gonna go ahead and open up the next poll. Go ahead and select the answer choice you think is the best answer here. And we'll talk about it. In just a few seconds. And then keep in mind to stay uh, stay on board till the very end. We'll be talking a little bit about promotions, other fun things. Starting to see some good answer choices. Come on in. Great job. Give you guys a few more seconds. And this concept, this pulmonary concept, it's, you know, these are pretty tough concepts. And in my experience, you know, when talking about respiratory physiology, these are the types of questions that usually trick people up. It's a pretty hard, you know, it's, it's a difficult concept to learn, you know, the, the negative pressure, the positive pressure, um, you know, uh, elasticity, compliance. 
So this is this is definitely a tough question. So we'll, we'll make sure that we talk about this a little bit. So I see that we've got a good amount of votes. I'll go ahead and close the poll. Okay, we will share those results. And what we see here is that we have um, 38% of people selecting answer choice D with a good smattering also selecting B and C. We'll go ahead and hide those results. We'll take a look at the correct answer. And the correct answer here is actually A. So only about 8% selected this answer choice. So definitely a tough question. So let's make sure that we understand what's going on. So this patient is forcibly expiring. Okay. So what does that mean? Okay, well, let's take a look here. And I want you guys to focus on primarily on this image right here. Okay, so during the breathing cycle, um, what we see is that alveolar pressure and intrapleural pressure, they fluctuate. Okay, at rest, right before inspiration, you can see that intrapleural pressure is negative. As inspiration begins, it becomes more negative, drawing air into the lungs. At the start of expiration, the intrapleural pressure works its way back up to baseline. Okay? Still negative, though. It's still negative. So intrapleural pressures are negative during normal respiration. However, if you forcibly expire, if you are using your accessory muscles, then that intrapleural pressure can become positive. That positive pressure forces air from the lungs quickly. Okay, that's how you can get a positive intrapleural pressure. However, that positive intrapleural pressure can actually cause collapse of the airways. So during forced expiration, airway compression will limit airflow. So this is important in patients who have diseases like COPD, where the traction of the airways is reduced and where forcible expiration can easily collapse those airways. So in, in normal patients, you may not have that much collapse of airways, but in patients with bad airways, they can easily become collapsed if you try to forcibly exhale. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully you see how during normal respiration, intrapleural pressure is all still negative, but how during forcible expiration, that can actually become positive. So hopefully you guys understand why answer choice A is the right answer. Answer choice E, transmural pressure, is usually always positive during physiologic uh, conditions. It is a difference between alveolar pressure and intrapleural pressure. Answer choice D, negative pleural pressure. That's usually negative during inspiration and passive expiration, but like we said, can actually become positive during forced expiration. Alveolar pressure, that is negative during inspiration, not expiration. And then answer choice B, um, this is equal to atmospheric pressure when there's no flow of air between the lungs and atmosphere, which is not the case normally. So the best answer choice here is answer choice A. And so we'll move on to question number three. Definitely a tough question. Well, thanks, Paris. Uh, well, thanks, this is Jeff. Uh, hopefully, uh, my uh, at least my audio, hopefully will be uh, 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 smooth down a little bit, but just wanted to uh, uh, apologize for the technical difficulties earlier, and uh, but also remind you uh, about RX Coach. Um, you know, having uh, having brilliant coaches like Paris and and, and Brenda, um, really just you know that that that's that's one part of the equation. We're here really to uh, to help you get to the next level, and you know. The way that we do that is we start with a 160 question assessment. Uh, so we we you know we really work to get a holistic view of where you're at uh, on your journey, trying to figure out where your where your strengths are, uh, where some of your challenges are, and that helps us 
uh, inform the you know the the study line, study plan that's personalized uh, for you. Now with you know RX Coach, we we do use a one on one approach, uh, and 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 again, you get to work with highly trained RX certified tutors. Uh, and you're both working off the same uh, from the, the the same resources, so you you get complementary access to uh, RX 360 Plus uh, and RX Bricks. So uh, you know again, we've uh, had a, a a student satisfaction rating uh, that's hovered right around 4.9 for uh, well over a year. So we've got you know plenty of students uh, who have uh, gone on. Uh, to succeed on the boards, uh, including uh, uh, you know one of your coaches here tonight, Brenda. So uh, if you are ready to set up a consult, just go to rx-coach.com and you can uh, find a day and time that works for you and and, and see if uh, uh, you know RX Coach is uh, uh, you know meets your needs. Okay, well with that we're going to go on to the uh, question number three. And again, we'll start off with the, uh, the, the lead-in. So which of the following complications is most likely to occur in this patient if he immediately begins to climb at high altitude? Okay, think about that. Think about what, uh, the, uh, what kind of information you need to be gathering uh, with, uh, with that kind of a lead-in as we read the stem. A healthy 19-year-old man has experienced nausea and fatigue since arriving yesterday in a high-altitude city for a mountaineering expedition. He has moderate dyspnea while climbing stairs and walking fast. He departs with the expedition team to go to a higher elevation to begin the climb. So the question, which of the following complications is most likely to occur in this patient if he immediately begins to climb at high altitude? And we're going to pause. We'll ask you, you know, how many steps do you think it will take to get to the right answer? Okay. And got some folks that are that are answering. So with that, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Pars. Pars. Thank you, Jeff. So what we're going to do now is we're going to show you what we think are the important clues in this vignette and the lead-in. So now we've got a younger patient, a 19-year-old man, and they specifically went out of their way to, to tell us that he's healthy, okay? So I always like to make note of that. Why are, why are they telling that uh, to us right off the bat, okay? They then tell us about his presenting signs and symptoms, nausea and fatigue, okay? And whenever you're dealing with these types of questions, you always want to make note of the temporal association. When do they arrive in this altitude? Is it yesterday? Was it a week ago? Because that may help uh, answer the question that they're going to ask you. They then tell us, importantly, that he is departing to a higher elevation. So in that lead-in, they're asking us the complication most likely to occur in this patient if he immediately begins to climb at high altitude. Okay? So. What we'll do is first figure out how many steps uh, this patient, uh, this question is requiring, and I think most likely a uh, two-step question. I think one, we've got to figure out um, what is going on, what is the condition here, um, and two, what is the complication if this persists, okay, or you know continues to climb. I think we've got a two-step question here. So let's go ahead. Let's take a look at those answer choices. Once again, we've got five answer choices. Once again, I'm going to start at the bottom and work my way up to the top. Answer choice E, respiratory acidosis. D, pneumothorax. C, pleural effusions. B, increased serum bicarbonate. And A, ataxia. So once again, I'm going to go ahead and open up that poll. Give me just a second. Which of the following complications is most likely to occur in this patient if he immediately begins to climb at high altitude? Poll should be open now. Go ahead and place your bets. And we'll talk about it in just a few seconds.
Okay, and once, once again, again that, uh, that, that oh, final yeah. word is cut off there, but uh, I think uh, I think you know what, uh, what what altitude is. It's like I'll over half of you have voted. Words. All right, now I'm going to go ahead and close that poll. Take a look at what everyone has voted for. Hopefully you guys are seeing these results. And what we see here is a favorite, answer choice E. Answer choice B coming in second place and answer choice A in third place. So let's go ahead, let's take a look at those answer choices or the correct answer, my apologies. And it is actually A, ataxia. It's a third place finisher. So let's take a look. What's going on in this question? Well, hopefully you guys picked up on that this patient is, you know, experiencing what we call altitude sickness. Okay. So this patient has nausea, fatigue, on uh, arriving at high altitude just yesterday. Okay. So altitude sickness, also what's uh, sometimes referred to as acute mountain sickness. Okay. Usually within the first six to 48 hours when you travel to an area of high altitude, okay? And this is driven by the lower partial pressure of oxygen at that high altitude. Usually, usually resolves by day three with rest and as your body and, and, and cardiovascular pulmonary system acclimate to that high altitude. However, if you continue to climb, even when experiencing that, you are at risk for certain complications. Okay. So what we see here is initially that at the very top, that initial response to high altitude. So you can see that low atmospheric oxygen, that low PaO2, leads to increased ventilation, respiratory alkal alkalosis, and what we call altitude sickness. So nausea, fatigue, lightheadedness. Okay. Eventually, your body starts to compensate. However, acute mountain sickness see that table at the very bottom. Eventually, acute mountain sickness, if, you, if it progresses, can lead to fluid accumulation, cerebral edema, okay? And this is due to increased capillary permeability in the brain, possibly due to high intracranial pressure. And if that were to progress, that could develop into pulmonary edema, high altitude pulmonary edema. That high altitude cerebral edema often presents as an encephalopathy and ataxic gait, as you can see there in the clinical, uh, in that cell, in that table, okay? So if this were to progress into cerebral edema, you could develop encephalopathy and ataxic gait, which is why ataxia is the best answer in this question, okay? Um, if we take a look at the other answer choices, let's talk about that real quick. Respiratory acidosis is actually the opposite of what we'd see. We would see respiratory alkalosis because we're hyperventilating. D, pneumothorax. Uh, this is common more so after trauma um, or uh, other chronic lung diseases. Pleural effusion, answer choice C. Um, that would be more so due to heart failure, liver failure. Um, lung infection or malignancy. Answer choice B, increased uh, serum bicarbonate. Um, that would be more so with metabolic alkalosis um, and then possibly renal compensation for respiratory acidosis, okay? So this patient would instead have hyperventilation, which is not uh, what you would expect with respiratory acidosis. So the best answer here is ataxia, and hopefully now you guys understand some of those additional complications that can arise after uh, acute mountain sickness or altitude sickness. So we'll go ahead and I'll turn it back over to you, Jeff, and we'll head on to question number four. Excellent, thank you, Paris. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a tricky one. Uh, tripped up uh, a, a number of you, but it's always good to uh, if you're going to miss a question, miss it on Question Lab, right? Uh, and uh, the 
and listen to Pars' explanations because that way you'll get this right on test day. Uh, this is our last question of the night. I do want to remind you, we do have a raffle coming up. So uh, uh, stick with us, stay tuned. And uh, with that, let us go ahead and start the final question. So let's everybody, uh, let's focus, see if we can end strong tonight. So question number four, our lead in, which of the following additional complications is most likely in this patient? Think about that as we read the vignette. A 35-year-old man with a known history of recent recreational drug use comes to the emergency department because of acute chest pain. Temperature is 38.2, pulse is 110, and blood pressure is 160 over 100. His pupils are dilated. X-ray of the chest shows pneumomediastinum. So again, the question, which of the following additional complications is most likely in this patient. Think about how many steps it would take for you to solve this one. And with that, I'll turn it over to Paris. Thank you, Jeff. So with our last question, what we're gonna do, we're also gonna show you what we think are the important clues in this vignette and lead in. And this is our fourth time doing that. So hopefully you guys are starting to get a sense, you know, as you dissect these questions, what are those important clues that you need to be taking note of? You know, what kind of things um, should you be thinking about as you go through these questions? So hopefully you guys are starting to pick up on some of those clues and some of those tips and tricks. We'll do that again with this question. So now we've got a 35 year old man, okay? And right off the bat, they're telling us that he's got a history of recent recreational drug use. So uh, once again, whenever they tell you something like that right off the bat, always makes you wonder why they're telling that to you, okay? Why is he coming in? Well, acute chest pain. They have some uh, physical exam findings, some, uh, some vital signs, and x-ray findings as well. All important to figure out exactly what's going on. So they're then asking us which of the following, or which additional complication is most likely in this patient? So I think once again, we probably got two-step question. One, we got to figure out exactly what's going on in this question. Two, what is an another complication from that condition? So an, I think another nice two-step question. Once again, we'll go ahead and uh, take a look at those answer choices. What we see here are five answer choices once again. Once again, we will start at the bottom and we'll work our way up to the top. Answer choice E, salivation. D, pulmonary embolism. C, pericarditis. B, lacrimation, and A, ischemic heart disease. So we'll go ahead and open up that poll. Go ahead and select the answer choice you think is the best answer, and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. Again, this is our last question of the night. Make sure that you uh, don't uh, don't step away without uh, recording your vote. Always make sure that you answer every question. You aren't penalized for your wrong answers. Looks like over half of you have uh, have answered. Getting close to that magic uh, three quarters number. So looks like uh, looks like we've got a clear favorite here, Pars. Yep, we looks like we've got answer choice A. Let me go ahead and close that poll. Let me go ahead and share those results. You can see here that answer choice A was the top favorite, the top vote getter, and answer choice C came in second. So let's take a look at the correct answer. And it is indeed A, so great job, way to finish strong. Let's take a look at this question and take a look exactly at what's going on one more time, okay? So this patient, they told us about recent recreational drug use. 
So hopefully you guys were thinking about cocaine, okay? It's got dilated pupils, hypertension, tachycardia, okay? And even pyrexia, even a little fever. So hopefully that's something you guys were thinking about. Now this patient has a dilated um, or has pneumomediastinum. And what that is from is probably due to alveolar rupture. So some of the alveoli are rupturing um, while, uh, you know, while patients in, in, inhale the drug, particularly with crack cocaine, you can actually have alveolar rupture due to a very strong pronounced valsalva, okay? Um, other causes of chest pain in someone who's using cocaine includes uh, uh, pneumothorax, coronary artery constriction, pulmonary infarction as well, okay? Now, cocaine can cause cardiac chest pain, and it can cause coronary vasoconstriction. So as you guys picked, it can cause ischemic heart disease. It can eventually lead to chest pain and an MI as well, even if your coronary arteries are otherwise normal, okay? So answer choice A is the best answer here. Let's take a look at the other answers in case you selected that. Answer choice E, that would be if this was a cholinergic drug like an organophosphate poisoning, okay? Answer choice D, um, pulmonary embolism can cause chest pain with tachycardia, but not associated with this drug. Answer choice C, uh, pericarditis, um, uh, also not associated with uh, this drug specifically, okay? Um, Answer choice B, lacrimation, that would also be a cholinergic symptom. So something to think about as well with organophosphates, um, other uh, cholinergic drugs as well. So the best answer choice here, like most of you guys selected, is answer choice A. So great job in today's question labs, definitely some tough questions. And I'll hand it back to you, Jeff. Whoops, very good. Yeah, thank you, Paris. Uh, and Yep, uh, had some good challenging questions, good, uh, I think a good mix tonight. Uh, hopefully uh, you you did well, and if even if you didn't, hopefully you learned a lot. Um, now, if you want to see, uh, see these questions and dig into them further, uh, here are the question IDs. So uh, you can always go into USMLE Rx if you've got your subscription and just uh, uh, pop these question IDs into Rx search. Um, and uh, you can uh, dig deeper because we've got the full explanations, including uh, the breakdowns of each of the incorrect answers, uh, as well as the connections to everything in first aid and in RxBricks.